good Josh, your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out the true story of Undertaker's WWE WrestleMania streak, man. This should be an interesting one when it comes to the Undertaker and his WrestleMania streak. It was one of the things that people definitely look forward to every time WrestleMania came around. Who's gonna break the streak? Will the streak continue? Will it actually break? I was one of the people that was in agreement of keeping the streak intact unless it was going to build up a potential new star. That was my kind of idea to keep it intact unless you plan on using it to build up someone else. I wasn't really in agreement with WWE taking the streak away from The Undertaker or giving it to Brock because I felt like Brock didn't need the streak to be a made man in WWE. Uh, I think that was just, in my opinion, I don't think it, it needed to happen, but other people may see differently, so, but uh, this should be a good video, appreciate all the love and support, man, and uh, let's get right into this one. No professional wrestler encompasses as much of the historical WrestleMania landscape as the dead man himself, The mm -hmm. Undertaker. His 27 matches across the first 36 events speak to an endurance befitting the infallible spectre that Mark Calloway portrayed for three decades. But more so than simply the sheer quantity of his first WrestleMania resume is what became known quite simply as the streak. Mm -hmm. In The Undertaker's first 21 WrestleMania matches, he defeated a who's who of wrestling royals, monsters, and oddities without seeding a single loss. The unbeaten run grew to mythic proportions and is perhaps the first line of the epitaph that defines The Undertaker's 30-year WWE run. I'm Jack from Cultaholic and this is the story of The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak. A legendary streak, you know. A legendary moment when he actually lost to Brock. A moment that I think many of us will not ever forget if you watched it live. It's just, you'll never forget WrestleMania 30 because of that, you know? When The Undertaker first arrived in the WWF in 1990, it became apparent that this wasn't going to be any ordinary wrestler. When you can convincingly portray an unflinching zombie mortician and do so <laughs> with the sort of gusto that gives the youth of the world nightmares, yep. then you've probably got staying power. I, I used to be hella afraid of The Undertaker and Kane. Like, they, it just, they, they embodied the character so much as a kid, I used to be terrified of them. A wrestler like The Undertaker isn't beaten all that easily, meant of either a magnesium stake or the recitation of an ancient spell to adequately slay. As such, it's no surprise that his first WrestleMania foray was little more than textbook enforcement of the overall Undertaker character. Undertaker's WrestleMania debut took place at the event's seventh incarnation on March 24th, 1991 in the city of Los Angeles. As was custom in those days, the WrestleMania undercard featured a great number of matches that didn't really have a feud or storyline purpose. They just existed to get everybody involved. And at this time, Undertaker was simply collecting victims regardless of the occasion. His opponent was aging star Superfly Jimmy Snooker, whom he dispatched in a matter of minutes. The yeah. match is mostly unnotable except as retroactive footage. It was the beginning of something that would one day be cherished. But here, it was just ho-hum, Undertaker squashed a guy. Mm -hmm. Following a face turn in early 92, Undertaker's WrestleMania forays started coming equipped with grudges. At Mania 8, he sent a treacherous Jake the Snake Roberts packing after tombstoning him on the floor. A year later, he withstood the onslaught of bodysuit-wearing mercenary giant Gonzalez yeah, before squeaking suit. out a DQ victory. And following a rest and recovery cringe. layoff in 1994, Taker returned to WrestleMania for the 11th event in 95, waylaying King Kong Bundy in the midst of his long and winding feud with the Million Dollar Corporation. To this point, the streak had not been formally acknowledged in any form, which mm -hmm. is to say that it probably wasn't even realized at the time that Undertaker was 4-0 at WrestleMania, at least by those in charge. And as the new age Andre the Giant in some respects, Undertaker was simply a colorful attraction. A popular means to an end that wasn't there to have all-time classic battles, but rather to vanquish various nuisances on the big stage. Him defeating a parade that. of heels at WrestleMania... I can see them booking him like that in the early stages, just like, you know, Undertaker, he's a... He's something that people want to see at WrestleMania. He's there to kind of just take out, you know, somebody that's a, a big threat in the company booking wise. So was more out of sensibility rather than a concentrated effort to make history at the time. In fact, the first WrestleMania match of his that one could consider really good was his victory over Diesel at WrestleMania 12. 
The battle of the big men was spirited enough and an outgoing Kevin Nash was more than happy to make Undertaker look strong on his way out the door. One year later, 5-0 became 6-0 when The Undertaker defeated Psycho Sid in a convoluted main event to become WWF Champion. The match was pretty bad by most measures, but more importantly, The Undertaker emerged with his first world title win in more than five years. And more important than that, another year passed without him sustaining an arbitrary WrestleMania loss. The streak mm -hmm. was still alive. But whether one was aware of the streak or not, they would have found it hard to fault the WWF if they'd had The Undertaker lose at WrestleMania 40. That's because the most imposing challenge to Undertaker's untarnished slate was his Hellspawn brother, Kane. Mm -hmm. Ever since he first confronted Taker months earlier, Kane had been presented as being just as powerful and just as invincible as his kayfabe sibling. Months of mounting tension led to WrestleMania 14 in Boston, where brother would meet brother in the event's semi-main. Undertaker eked out the victory that night over Kane to the surprise of those who figured it would have been a major feather in Kane's mask to ultimately overpower the Phenom. Yeah, but Kane that would have definitely gave Kane the extra rub that he needed if he actually would have beat the Undertaker then. Kane didn't go down lightly, requiring three tombstones to finally leave him in a crumpled heap. And so the Undertaker was now 7-0. Though the previous year's match against Sid was for the WWF Championship, one could certainly argue that this was Undertaker's most memorable WrestleMania match to this point. There was an actual storyline to Undertaker and Kane, whereas Taker vs. Sid was kind of randomly thrown together due to the general disarray of the 1997 main event scene. One year later, Undertaker won a WrestleMania bout that was far less memorable as it was, but would have been even less memorable if not for the questionable ending. Now the ruler of the hellish <laughs> Ministry of Darkness, Taker battled the corporation's lead heavy, the Big Boss Man, inside Hell in a Cell. But while Undertaker's prior two cell matches are all-time classics, mm -hmm. this was a dull slog for the finish line, but alas, another Undertaker victory. Oh, and yeah, the, the Big Boss Man was hanged in the post-match, but that grisly sight notwithstanding, the Undertaker's wrestle- Yeah, that <laughs> killed this man <laughs> live on pay-per-view. <laughs> WrestleMania record remained unblemished at 8-0. After missing out on WrestleMania 2000 due to injuries, the biker version of The Undertaker was what mm. rolled into WrestleMania X7 in Houston to do battle with sworn enemy Triple H. Yep. While the brawl was probably Taker's best WrestleMania match up until then, and it brought mm -hmm. the record to 9-0 at the event, something more match. notable happened. His record was finally acknowledged. Now, granted, this was just a quick offhand mention by Jim Ross on commentary, but regardless, it wasn't until The Undertaker was more than eight matches deep into his personal WrestleMania. And that's what makes this so kind of cool. People really wasn't paying attention to it until, like, oh, wait a minute. he He's on an actual streak. He hasn't lost ever at WrestleMania. Hold on. And that's when they, they start to slowly but surely transition to the story of, Who's going to beat the streak? People start focusing on the streak and beating The Undertaker, being that one person. Near chronology that the WWF openly broadcast this historic record. One year later, Undertaker waged war with Ric Flair in a highly contentious battle at WrestleMania X8 or 18. Which one do we call it again? The methodical, hate-filled slugfest was an interesting pairing of icons and one that also gave us the lesser-known spine buster out of nowhere, courtesy of Arn Anderson. After finishing off Flair with his tombstone instead of the last ride, Undertaker gave us one of the greatest silent acknowledgements in wrestling history. That's because he stood on the apron and slowly unfurled all ten of his fingers before raising both outstretched palms to a sizable cheer. 10-0. Ten 10-0, and and indeed. To put that record into perspective, it took 15 more years for any other wrestler to even reach 10 total wins at the event, when John Cena gained a win as part of a mixed tag match at WrestleMania oh, 33. Wow. And at the time of Undertaker's 10th win, Cena was still swimming to the shores of the main roster. After polishing off Flair to reach double digits, Taker's WrestleMania resume picked up a couple more no-doubt victories. At Mania 19 in Seattle, Taker was supposed to team with Australian Goliath Nathan Jones against Big Show and A-Train. But it ended up being a handicap match out of deference to Jones's, shall we say, profound clunkiness. Mm. In any event, Undertaker winning was the only acceptable result, and that's exactly what happened. The following year, Undertaker's WrestleMania match was all about the pomp and pageantry. Kane had snuffed him out the prior year in a buried alive match, but rather mm -hmm. than just, you know, staying dead, the Phenom version of The Undertaker was reborn. And I like that. It, it's, it's cool. This is arguably, I think a lot of people agree here, Vince's greatest 
character creation. So the fact that they got rid of the, the biker gimmick, he was buried alive, and now we have the phenom back. I love that, man. It's 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 always dope when a wrestler can balance different views of their character, like Mick Foley being able to balance all his, you know, personalities that he has, and they have their own characters, their own type of style, the way they deliver promos, the badass gimmick, and then the phenom gimmick. It just works, and not many people can pull that off being able to have multiple personalities they all are distinguishable but it's in one person and make it somewhat believable it, it takes it takes some talent to be able to do that and with him came all that old accompaniment the graveyard overture the druids paul bearer of course the urn and the hat and the trench coat and with that sort of grand return kane had a better chance of winning a spelling bee while in a medically induced coma than actually beating the undertaker yeah. that night that win made it a solid dozen. Come 2005, however, the streak was more than just an accomplishment worth calling attention to, it was now a specified target. Mm -hmm. Randy Orton looked to make good on his legend killer nickname by challenging Undertaker's untarnished mark. In the closing stages of the very competitive bout, Orton deftly reversed a choke slam into that an RKO fantastic. and looked for all the world like the WWE was about to canonize a 25-year-old Randall Keith as the Demon Slayer. Yep. But then The Undertaker kicked out. kicked out. A tombstone later and Orton's dream was all that was killed. With the streak now sitting at 13-0 and with an understandable opening for a loss passed up on, it looked as if WWE was content to let it ride forever. Though Mark Henry would eventually pick up traction as the curator of his self-created Hall of Pain, the hall was still very much under construction in 2006, and he was the one getting the lid closed on him in the WrestleMania 22 casket match. Mm -hmm. Make that 14-0 for The Undertaker. From there, a pair of championship bouts loomed large, but few truly believed Undertaker's record was in jeopardy. And this should take nothing away from Batista and Edge, but for the respective World Heavyweight title matches at WrestleMania's 23 and 24, the timing just didn't seem right for either man to pull that. Yeah, uh, I remember watching Batista, I think that was WrestleMania 23, uh, trying to, you know, dethrone The Undertaker. Wasn't going to happen. Same thing with Edge. They were enjoyable matches, but you could kind of tell those weren't going to be the guys to do it. Sword from the stone. And so, despite two very excellent matchups, with the Batista one especially surprising yeah. a lot of people at the time, the end good. result never really seemed to be in doubt. The tombstoning of Drax brought the mark to 15-0, while the Money Planes grounding at Hell in a Cell notched it up further to 16-0. After 2008, The Undertaker never wrestled in another championship match at WrestleMania, nor did he really need to, in fairness. Mm. His streak was now reward enough, and his yep. matches were about to become the hallmark segment of ensuing manias. And this is one of those things where it became bigger than the title. The Undertaker streak was bigger than the championship was at this point, especially at WrestleMania, because it's one of those things where it's like people were coming to see who could actually get the job done. And whoever did would be immortalized in WrestleMania and be pushed to the moon. So it was like, no one really cares about him having a championship no more. Is now, can people, who can beat him? That's the, the thing about streaks in sports. You always want to see, you really, people see who's going to lose. Like people pay to see who's going to beat this person. Will he ever lose? Is there anybody that's good enough to beat that individual? That's usually how uh, undefeated streaks grant you know bring in that attention so belt or no belt when Shawn michaels stepped up to the plate for oh wrestlemania boy. 25 Some in 2009 many wondered if the 240 somethings could equal the quality and gravity of their Some hell of the in a cell match way back in 1997 in WrestleMania history. depending on who you ask their heaven versus hell epic may not have only surpassed the cell match but could even be the greatest wrestlemania match of all time and it was in houston and it was literally one of the best matches I have ever seen at WrestleMania. It's it. There's no denying it. That is a match. With, I put this match in probably my top 10 favorite matches of all time. I have to. It's just that goddamn good. The half-hour spectacle was a so puzzle good. for the ages. So and good. after Undertaker gave the world a meme-worthy look of dejection, he caught a Michaels moonsault and planted HBK with the decisive tombstone climbing to 17-0. 
A year later, a desperate and freakishly competitive Michaels drew Undertaker's oh, ire and got the rematch so he good. desired. So good. But to receive it, he'd have to stake his career. And here, even the odd Undertaker fan was kind of hoping that maybe he'd take the fall, otherwise we'd have to say goodbye to Michaels' glittering mm -hmm. career. But that's exactly what we did at WrestleMania 26, as the two icons nearly equaled their prior effort, yeah. and the Defiant Michaels went out to another tombstone. It wasn't as good as the first, but it was it's damn near close. It's damn near close. Still a fantastic match to watch. Michaels' tearful exodus overshadowed 18-0 to an extent, but 18-0 was still 18-0. Yeah. By now, it was abundantly clear that The Undertaker's WrestleMania match was an attraction all to itself. Not only because of the streak being on the line, but the increased reduction in Undertaker's work schedule yep. that put more focus on his Mania outings. And because of this, he was very much saving his best performances for that springtime Sunday. The previous four WrestleMania matches had all either been match of the year candidates or at least comfortably in that conversation. And that certainly didn't change in 2011 when what was apparently intended to be Undertaker vs. Sting pivoted into Undertaker vs. Triple H after Sting reportedly got cold feet about a move to WWE. Mm. The match met the lofty expectations of the new standard for Undertaker's Mania clashes. But rather than build to the usual feverish crescendo, the ending took a different route. The game managed to beat Undertaker down into a writhing shell, but just couldn't seal the deal. Mm -hmm. Then, out of desperation, Taker snared Triple H into Hell's Gate and managed to squeeze out a narrow submission win. And that was an enjoyable Undertaker match as well. Undertaker won, but was shown to be in a bad way afterwards. Mm -hmm. The following year, it was now The Undertaker who desired revenge, wanting to show that he wasn't as decrepit as the events of WrestleMania 27 seemed to indicate. With 20-0 at the edge of the horizon, Undertaker goaded corporate Triple H into accepting one more match, but there would be two counter caveats. It would take place inside Hell in a Cell. One of the better Hell in a Cell matches, the end of an era match. It was so good. It's so good to have, tri have Triple H in there, to have The Undertaker in there, and to have uh, Shawn Michaels as the special guest referee all these guys, their careers have been entwined in the Hell in a Cell. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love this match. Oh, I love this match. Well, and Shawn Michaels would be the special guest referee. Oh, really the so-called end of an era end match at WrestleMania era. 28 polarized fans. Some consider it an all-timer, while others found it a little bit inferior and perhaps a bit too self-indulgent. But the end result was indeed 20-0, as Undertaker vanquished Triple H for the third time on the grandest stage of them yep. all. And this one featured an extra scary kick out as Michael's super kick taker into a pedigree, possibly the scariest moment of his undefeated streak. I legitimately thought it's over. I'm watching it live. I'm getting goosebumps now. When that happened, I was like, oh, it's over. This is how they end the streak. And he kicked out. And I couldn't believe it. I literally just... I couldn't believe I was getting goosebumps. I was losing my shit. I could not believe he kicked out. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and at the time of this video's recording, at least, it should be noted that while Undertaker reached 20 WrestleMania wins in 2012, no other wrestler before or since has gone beyond 10 wins at the event. Mm -hmm. After four years of battling the two click cornerstones, Undertaker moved on to a wrestler in a similar position to Kane and Orton before him. He was an undeniable star that could have used the win over Taker at WrestleMania, and it would have been an acceptable choice in the eyes of many. And his name CM was Punk. CM Punk. Though it wasn't Punk's first wish of being eliminated first in a John Cena vs. The Rock World title main event, it still proved to be the best match of a mostly middling WrestleMania 29. Yeah. After some exciting back and forth, including the timeless Anaconda Vice zombie sit-up spot, Punk succumbed like the 17 other men before him. The streak had reached a staggering 21 victories, but it wouldn't see number 22. On the surface, most figured that there was no reason for Brock Lesnar to defeat The Undertaker. And I still believe in that. There's no, he doesn't need it. He never needed it. You cannot argue me this point. Brock beating The Undertaker streak still doesn't make sense to me. It's a shocking moment, but it'll never make sense to me because it didn't matter. He was going to become the next champion. He was next in line. It didn't. He didn't need the streak for that. You know what I'm saying? I, I think it was just. 
I don't. I, I. I just. I never understood that booking decision. I just don't think he needed it. It's. It's fucking Brock. He's the legitimate UFC fighter, former UFC champion at the time. Like, bro, he's legitimate. He don't need that. <laughs> you could have did something else with him. But that's just my personal opinion. For one thing, he was a part-time talent, and surely WWE wouldn't sacrifice 23 years of build at the altar of someone that only wrestled a handful of times a year. Yeah. And on top of that, Brock was already a made man, Thank an iconic you. athlete with legitimate credentials yes. as a UFC heavyweight champion, so it's not like he really needed the boost. When Lesnar took a concussed, weary Undertaker and deposited him with a third F5 at WrestleMania 30, the packed house at New Orleans' Superdome watched with a bit of a half-hearted gaze. Here comes the kick out, most yeah. figured. That's why when Chad Patton's hand slapped the mat for a third time, it struck everybody's guts. I will never, just watching it, because he hit him with a, another F5, I'm like, bro, he's kicking out. And then, because the match was, it was lukewarm. It, it, obviously, he was concussed. He couldn't really move like he wanted to. Like, that match wasn't really on paper. On paper, it should have been better, but it wasn't as good, because, you know, The Undertaker was injured, and it just... They were, it just wasn't that good. But the fact when he kicked out, I just, I couldn't believe what I saw. You're riding the high of, of Daniel Bryan being Triple H, being inserted into the triple threat match at the end of the show. You're feeling good. And then you see that happen. You instantly just like, it killed the audience. They couldn't, they couldn't believe what they saw. It was just like, no way. I couldn't believe it. It's, it's a moment in history for for wrestling fans that it, it changed everything for us because it's now it's like what the what the hell what, what did we just see what did we just watch it felt like a cosmic jostle a profound shock that causes blood within your veins to evaporate the streak is dead we all thought Classic and meme. the 21 in one graphic that flashed overhead confirmed the unthinkable yep the 21 event streak seemed so unbreakable that the idea of Brock Lesnar challenging it didn't phase that many fans and critics. That's the Brock Lesnar who is a snarling killing machine that's portrayed as every bit the terrifying fighter that and he actually that. is. Just another notch for Undertaker's belt, we all thought. Yeah. Another tombstone, another number in the world. And no fan who witnessed it will ever forget how they felt when reality Never. sunk in. In the aftermath, we learned just how arbitrary the decision to end the streak was. Vince McMahon opted to kill off the unbeaten run on the day of WrestleMania 30, believing that one, no one outside of Lesnar was a viable candidate to end it, and two, The Undertaker didn't have many matches left, so the sooner the better. That doesn't even make sense to me. <laughs> what the hell? The sooner the better? No! That was the one thing people wanted to see, to see if someone could actually do it. And it's like, all right, you, you kind of take it away. I get it. It makes sense. Brock does make sense on paper to beat it. But once again, I feel like if you're going to do it, it needs to be somebody that can benefit from it. Brock didn't benefit from it other than he was just a mega heel at that time because of it. He didn't benefit from it. He was already made man. That's just my opinion. But him doing that is just like, well, you, you could have just had him keep the streak going. And maybe whoever they want to build up next could be the guy to do it. And they get a, you know, they get that boosted boost from beating the Undertaker. Now this is a new, a new generation, a new guy that's ready to take over the mantle. Like, I don't know, man. I just, I just think in hindsight, that was just, oh, well, he don't have that many matches left. Let's go ahead and end it. Why? For what? Just because he ain't got that many matches left? That means, hell, Whoever does actually do it, it should be one of those things where it's like it's, it's his last WrestleMania match. That's my opinion. If The Undertaker's going to lose, it should be his last WrestleMania match. So, many years later, the decision to end the streak is still widely debated. Some feel it should have been preserved forever, sanctified and hallowed, so, while yes. others believe that another wrestler should have gotten the honors yeah. instead of someone like Lesnar that didn't strictly... That's... I, I'm, 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 I'm in that boat of someone if... I'm okay if he it never would have gotten broken. Cool. He would have retired with a perfect streak. Cool. But I'm also okay if someone that could have benefited from the win actually got the win. So. Need it. Meanwhile, some were ultimately okay with the booking because to even the most cynical, seen-it-all-before fan, the streak dying before their very eyes shook them from their default state. 
The people who relish calling other wrestling fans marks were probably marks themselves when they witnessed the streak's mm -hmm. end. Wrestling is at its best when you get caught up in it, even if it requires pissing you off. True. When Undertaker I can see that. finally pulled himself up after the match, he was met with increasing applause from fans and ringsiders alike. The pictures told the tale of unanimous respect for a man that sustained such an unforgettable run. Mm -hmm. And if one were to speculate, perhaps this was the dead man's so called last ride. Except it, it wasn't. wasn't. In fact, The Undertaker wrestled 19 more times between then and 2020. Five of those matches occurred at WrestleMania. There was a simple but affable win over Bray Wyatt at 31, a convoluted cell match with Shane McMahon at 32, mm -hmm. a bit of a hard to watch loss to Roman Reigns at 33 that appeared to be his official end, yeah. but then a bizarre squash of John Cena at 34, and finally the well-received Boneyard match win over AJ Styles at 36. Enjoyable. 25 event wins is not match. likely to be matched by anyone. Close nope. to eight months after leaving Styles for dead under a mountain of dirt, Undertaker affirmed his retirement, bringing to an end not only an unparalleled wrestling career, but an event legacy that's just as unequaled. WrestleMania 35 was a recent enough reminder that the grand spectacle can in fact occur without The Undertaker, but it isn't quite the same without him. Mm -hmm. When Taker is inevitably the headliner of a future WWE Hall of Fame class, there'll be a deep body of work to retroactively dissect. The ghoulish mystique, the harrowing gimmick matches, the awing brilliance of his character work, and the main event rivalries will all spring to mind. The strongest threads in the tapestry that is The Undertaker's WWE legacy will be the ones that make up his WrestleMania streak, as well as the Mania matches that occurred following its end. The variety of opponents he faced is a murderer's row of characters. He faced Jake Roberts and CM Punk, Diesel and Batista, mm -hmm. King Kong Bundy and John Cena. He faced the fathers of Charlotte Flair and Tamina and the sons of IRS and Seeker. He battled members of the Click in six different matches across three separate decades. That's his incredible. tenth Mania win was over the face of Jim Crockett Promotions and his last was over the face of TNA. 10 of his victims are That's in the WWE crazy. Hall of Fame, while four of his opponents are on WWE's active roster today still. Few of the wrestlers have made such an indelible mark on the business that they share the ring in high profile matches with those many generational waves of talents. That in itself may be the ultimate legacy of The Undertaker and The Streak, forever intertwined as constants in a business and a world where there are fewer constants than we'd like. We tend to fear death and its inevitability, but ironically, wrestling fans embrace the inevitability of both the dead man and his thorough dominance at the most watched wrestling event of the year. The this was a cool video. I, I enjoyed this video a lot. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things where this debate will probably continue on <laughs> forever on should have should Brock have beaten The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30? Should he kept his streak? Uh, intact before retiring or should someone else have beaten the undertaker at some point like this will always be a debate you guys know where i stand on it but uh comment down below let me know do you guys feel like the undertaker should have kept his streak intact before retiring do you guys agree with brock lesnar beating the streak or do you guys feel like someone else should have beaten the streak instead of brock i want to get your guys opinion on it man this is uh this is one of those topics in wrestling that no one people can't agree on and i'm okay with it because it's just a monumental situation that happened and uh it's one of those scenes where i'll, I'll never forget i'll never forget that moment but appreciate all the love and support road to 70k appreciate y'all kicking with me see y'all next one